we have participated in a very useful and a very good for everyone event but even pleasant things end at some point so today we are going to finish our work but in the very beginning I would like to stress the following it's not by chance that our organi organizers of this event started the work of this forum with the seminar devoted to the monitoring of um, law application and now we are finishing it with the problems of civil law. Why am I saying that it is not by chance? This is very reasonable uh, because in the course of uh, monitoring there is a chance to uh, m follow how laws perform in real life, which norms operate well, which uh, don't operate well, and which uh, don't function at all. And then we can give recommendations to legislators which laws need to be revised and modified. The final stage of this forum devoted uh, to the um, international civil law is um, again very important because in the near future we are going to receive a new version of our civil code which uh, at least in its ideal form is uh, aimed at provision of further step-by-step -step continuous development of our economy. It is very symbolic that in the civil law part of this forum there's a number of sessions and in this includes a session on the international private law. It has been stressed many times. I, for example, in the speech of our Prime Minister, Mr. Medvedev, and then uh, Mr. Ivanov uh, continued that statement that for the current world, competition of different uh, legal uh, systems uh, is typical, but both of them stressed. But if this competition takes place in a normal, friendly, um, and mutually beneficial relations, this is good because different countries can expand their experience and this is to the benefit of both countries. And I believe that the norms of the international private law um, is even more important in this respect because the law is a reflection of, uh, sovereign, of the sovereign status of any country. And this uh, acts in the boundaries of this, uh, within the boundaries of the state, and that's why there's a rule that the norms of a national regulatory system, they are applicable on the territory of the country where they have been issued. But the state and citizens and organizations of this country, they interrelate with each other. And that's why sometimes there is a need for courts of one country uh, to uh, apply laws of another country. But due to this sovereign status in one uh, country, foreign legal norms can be applied only if um, the country we're speaking about accepts these norms and uh, this is what collision um, norms are about. In relation to this, there's a number of issues. Okay, let's say Let's say that there's an international agreement between Russia, uh, between a Russian and a Finnish uh, organization. The countries agreed uh, to use German law, and it is possible to do that. But there's a question. In uh, both legal systems, especially in the civil uh, law system, there are two types of norms. There's a dispositive norm that can be changed 
um, by this agreement and also imperative norms that cannot be changed or modified. And when we are on the territory of the Russian Federation, when we use uh, German law, does it mean that it substitutes the uh, active uh, law of the Russian Federation? But which ones? Only those which are dispositive or those which are imperative? In principle, of course, both of them, except for the norms uh, that have uh, been um, called overriding mandatory rules. But um, right now, uh, according to the uh, Russian version of the code, uh, there will be uh, norms uh, which are mandatory, mandatory for application because they will function even, even uh, if the national law uh, in relation to a certain agreement is substituted by the by an international law. And uh, in the new uh, version of the civil code, there uh, will be certain revisions. Another point, right, parties may agree uh, to apply uh, the law of uh, some uh, foreign uh, state. But again, uh, there are exceptions to that. And this should be uh, touched upon as well. Then, uh, if due to certain reasons the parties haven't agreed upon the direct material law, uh, and this is quite often, and uh, this is not uh, because uh, they signed an agreement in a hurry. No, uh, this is because both parties would like to conclude this contract and uh, they have approved all its terms and conditions apart from the applicable law. But because both parties uh, cannot um, live without it and let's say, okay, let's hope there won't be any dispu disputes or claims. And if we do have um, a dispute, then the court will decide which law uh, shall be applied. All right, but then there is a question. Okay, if we uh, use uh, these norms uh, that are meant that are meant uh, to be used uh, in such cases, but these collision norms, uh, who are they mandatory for? For the parties or for the court? And uh, not for the parties, uh, b because they can uh, step aside uh, from those. They have a right to do that. But for the court, they are mandatory in principle. But um, we need to uh, qualify which court we are speaking about. And our uh, supreme uh, for supreme courts, yeah, that's uh, compulsory. Uh, but as for an international arbitration course, uh, court, uh, here I uh, could say that the situation is more flexible because if we uh, take a model law on international commercial arbitration, then we can see that, thank you, that um, arbitration uh, Judges, yeah, they. What if there's no uh, law? If they don't, uh, if it hasn't been specified, then uh, they uh, use those uh, norms that they uh, view as advisable. And here, the arbitration court has a wider. Um, uh, range of opportunities. I have a, a quite a rich experience of almost 20 years working in the arbitration uh, court and I don't remember, that, uh, I cannot I think not even about a single case when uh, the courts deviated uh, from the uh, collision norms of the country where it is situated. So in practice, definitely, these norms influence largely to the selection of the applicable law, especially when the parties, due to a number of reasons, uh, didn't use the opportunity they have under uh, Lex Voluntatis norm. 
And I believe right now it is extremely important for us to have a look how our new norms will be functioning, new norms of the civil code, and this includes a number of um, cases, including the international private law. I would like, in a way, to continue the idea, to expand on the idea that uh, has been uh, mentioned already many times uh, at this forum. We uh, shouldn't hurry uh, to amend the laws. If some norm is introduced, it uh, needs uh, to have time and um, I uh, sometimes think about uh, words of the words uh, by uh, Zhirinovsky. Uh, we uh, shouldn't uh, blame a bride or a groom, so let them live together for some time. So, and I believe uh, this should be applied uh, to the norms that we are discussing. Okay, yeah, there, are, there can be some words of criticism and maybe they will be modified by the Dumar. Uh, during this legislative uh, process, but when, th when they become a law, again, we need uh, to take a, a look. Uh, we need to allow these norms to function. And then, in the course of monitoring, and then again, we shouldn't uh, make hasty conclusions. So uh, there should be several years uh, of monitoring, and then we can say which norms are viable and stable and so on. So that's why I believe we have this very creative task to monitor uh, and observe those norms that uh, very soon will become a law. It is extremely important that the norms of our national legislation should correspond uh, to what is accepted in the international law. That is why I believe we'll be absolutely right if we give the floor uh, to uh, Mrs. Eloise Ellen Tates, who is the uh, first secretary of the Hague Conference on International Private Law. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm an outsider and an observer and clearly not an expert on the Russian civil code, the current one, and for that matter, the amendments. Um, I'm here in a, a sort of a split role. I represent the Hague Conference on Private International Law, which I guess in Russian is Gaga. Yeah? Okay. Um, and we are the one of the three, probably the we'd like to say the the most preeminent um, intergovernmental organization involved in unifying the laws of the rules of private international law so global rules for private international law um, we date from 1893 when we had the first ad hoc conferences and Russia indeed was one of the um, participants in the early Hague conference and um, we have currently 72 member countries, uh, 71 plus the European Union is a member on its own, that we have almost 140 countries that are party to one or more of our conventions, and I'll, I'll mention them in a minute. But So one side of my um, career is on unifying globally private international law. The other side is I am a um, professor of private international law from the United States where I've taught that for 25 years at law school. And the U.S. has no code for private international law. It is uh, except for the state of Louisiana and the state of um, Oregon, it is all judge made, and we have basically seven theories approximately. Um, the restatement of the second of the law of conflicts is probably the best known and used most widely, but basically, people um, have a lack of predictability 
and uh, there is a great deal of forum shopping to get the law that you want to be applied, that the rules for private international law that are most favorable. And there is, of course, a bias on the part of the forum to apply its own rules. In fact, one theory that three states, I think it's at three or two states in the U.S. of the 50 have is one called um, the uh, Lex Fori, Law of the Forum. They always apply the Law of the Forum. So, um, as I said, I have these two sides, one that has no order or reason and the other side which tries to have global rules. Um, the Hague Conference conventions um, are conventions that uh, attempt to unify the rules of private international law in different areas, but not the underlying substantive law. So, for instance, um, one of the conventions that Russia now is considering, the 1996 Convention on the Protection of the Child, has rules of private international law, applicable law for, for, um, for uh, custody and other aspects of uh, rights of children. It also has rules on jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement. And um, in the Hague Conventions generally, one of the underlying concepts is that of habitual residence rather than nationality. Um, and um, Professor Asikov and I were just talking about this, that the new code for Russia um, looks at a concept of common domicile rather than nationality, which is much very similar to habitual residence, um, not quite the same, but it's, it's not strictly a nationality-based one. So our conventions actually um, have this concept. Um, we all, in connection with... Um, the um, work at the Hague Conference, we are working on, for the first time, non-binding rules on the applicable law for commercial contracts. And um, I think the rules that are being used are, or coming up with are very similar to those that uh, the European Union has in its new code. And I think um, the focus on party autonomy um, and parties being able to select roles is similar to the new Russian code as well, as uh, Professor Musin was discussing. Um, it, it seems to me as a, um, an outsider that one of the, the important aspects of the new code is that it, it is... Um, fostering legal certainty and predictability, which is obviously very important for commercial transactions and trade. Um, and I notice um, similarities with uh, the European rules, uh, regulations, Rome 1 um, and Rome 2, but with Rome 1, but also um, similarities with the U.S. system, although ours is not codified. I had looked at um, the section on infliction of harm, and um, I guess it's section 1219, and it looks to the um, common re residence or domicile of the parties rather than nationality, and I thought that was interesting because in the U.S., although we don't have a rule, um, one of the Premier Scholars, Simeon Simonides, um, has done all these empirical studies and showed that no matter which theory the U.S. state court uses, it tends to end up, when there is a common domicile, applying that law in um, tort cases and, and cases of infliction of harm. Um, I also noticed the code um, does have the strong emphasis on um, party autonomy in many areas for contract, which again I think is 
um, in keeping with the, the um, increasing global tendency in that area and as I mentioned um, in keeping with the work that is currently being done at the Hague Conference on the um, applicable uh, rules for, for applicable law in commercial contracts. Um, I did want to say from the Hague Conference standpoint that in addition to needing um, certainty and predictability through codes of private international law and civil law in general, um, one of the problems increasingly um, as the more and more courts apply foreign law is access to the content of that foreign law and how one can get it. The Hague Conference has done some work on that, but at the moment the members um, are not, um, have not put that in the high priority for, for current work, but we have worked on a project that would attempt to um, harmonize or unify the way in which uh, laws are kept at the information so that one could get access to it. And there has been discussion about some sort of either non-binding or binding instrument where countries, the courts in those countries would provide the content of the foreign law to another court. Um, in the Hague Conference, in some of our conventions, in particular one that I have supervision over, the 1980 Child Abduction Convention, um, which Russia just acceded to uh, this past year, the 1980 Convention, we have direct judicial communication, um, although it's not specifically provided for in the Convention, we have a network of judges in the different countries where they provide information to each other on, if necessary, on aspects of their own legal system and procedures. So um, as courts have to deal with foreign law, I think this becomes increasingly a problem and one that, that a global um, binding or non-binding approach principles might be more valuable. Um, also, obviously, as courts apply other countries' laws and as they deal with more and more cross-border transactions. There's the increased need to enforce um, resulting judgments. And the Hague Conference has just taken up again. Um, it had put aside for 10 years its project on recognition and enforcement of judgments. And that project this April at the Council Governing Board of Members was given um, approval to go forward. Um, we also have a convention on choice of court agreements where parties select the forum. That forum will be enforced as will the resulting judgment. And that in fact is analogous to the New York Convention for Arbitral Awards. And, um, at our council meeting last month, Deputy uh, Minister of Justice Lubimov uh, spoke and mentioned that uh, Russian Federation was in fact reviewing the Choice of Court Convention. They were reviewing other conventions, including the Maintenance Convention, and um, members were very interested and happy to see the active engagement of the Russian Federation in these um, global instruments. Um, finally, I might mention that along with um, the need for predictability and certainty in what law applies, obviously, is an overall approach to legal cooperation and the modern Hague Conventions although not dealing with the underlying substantive law, deal with providing legal cooperation and assistance. I mentioned the non-binding direct judicial communication in connection with the children's conventions, but we do have the um, service convention and the evidence convention and apostille. Um, Russia is signatory, I know, to the service and evidence convention. So, 
along with being able to um, apply the foreign law, being able to engage in um, obtaining documents or serving parties cross-border are equally significant. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your brief but very uh, concise and interesting speech. I think it won't be the last. Now, I would like to say this. In the legal community, uh, there is a saying, old, old, uh, uh, the, uh, the lawyers criticize uh, old laws and command new laws. And I'm sure there will be many commands on the new civil code. Uh, based on my scholarly and educational experience, I think it's a very rare thing that the commentary can be practically useful. The commander just retells the essence of the law. I can read too. I know what's written there, but there is one exception. I'm completely convinced that a very good and substantial commentary is the commentary written by those who actually wrote the laws because they explain what they wanted to say in the first place and what was their idea when they were drafting the laws which practice actually shows the the idea of the legislators uh, is evident from this commentary and we're very lucky because we have Mr. Anton Asoskov here who is the member of the working team of the Codification Council and he was directly uh, participating in the legal work on international private law. He's also the uh, associate professor of Moscow legal uh, department of Moscow University. He's a scholar, a practitioner of law and to an extent a legislator and I think that no one can be a better judge of uh, what the uh, draft is meant as regards the private law. We'll know later what will come out of that but we'll know now what they meant so we give the floor to him. Thank you very much. Could you please project my presentation onto the screen and how can I change the slides? Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my function today is to try to explain what the working team meant. Uh, the team that prepared the changes and amendments to Part 6 um, International Private Law of the Russian Civil Code. And first and foremost, the question which probably arises and which, is obliquely, uh, which was obliquely voiced here in our moderator's um, words why was it necessary to change Part 6 International Private Law, considering that since it had been prepared, um, it was prepared just about 10 years ago? In my opinion, it was necessary. First, other parts of the Civil Code are also being amended, and these amendments are substantial, which also touch on international private law. Uh, I would like to uh, point your attention to the exclusion of, of point three, uh, which was traditionally present in Russian civil law. And uh, the idea was that it is necessary to have a written international contract. All other provisions uh, like uh, 1009, uh, t uh, 1209 uh, was um, person, person to that. Uh, so all other norms could not touch on 1209. Also, the drafters of other parts of the civil code uh, suggested to uh, set up a number of new institutions of civil law like the Institute 
of obligations due to um, transactions and negotiations which were not conducted in good faith. Which kind of law is applicable to these situations unless we make it very specific and uh, we include some kinds of conflict of law rules? Uh, and, uh, in other cases, we'll put the practitioners of law uh, facing this very complex situation, and they'll have to deal with that on their own. Also, there is a presidential decree which was actually which actually gave the commission to uh, amend the civil code, and uh, the decree points out the necessity to. Um, pay attention to the European experience because lately in the European Union there were some major changes in international private law. First of all, acceptance of two documents which um, uh, our esteemed colleague from the Hague Conference has just uh, said, the Rome 1 rule uh, and Rome 2. Uh, on non-contract law. These two documents appeared in the, ne in the last few years after uh, our Section 6 of international private law was already drafted. Um, so we had to, to uh, take it into account when drafting the new version. And lastly, which, which is probably the most important thing, we could not overlook the problems that we saw in Russian arbitration practice. Just one example, which you know very well, the so-called megaphone case, when the Russian court concluded that the shareholders' agreement regarding, uh, regarding Russian companies cannot be subject to foreign law. So we had a feeling that we can't not say anything useful about that and suggest some kind of a legal remedy because we thought that this approach in legal practice, in court practice, was not completely in step with today's needs. I would also like to stress that our um, authority was limited. Uh, we had to upgrade the uh, rules of international private law, only those that were included in the civil code. So we didn't have authority to change the, the uh, laws um, in the domestic law, in the labor law, and even though we, had, we knew that such changes were necessary. Also, we didn't consider the expedience of passing a separate law on international private law because uh, we were talking about uh, codification work, about the uh, upgrade of the Russian Civil Code. Now, without I, I will try not to bore you too much and to outline some of the changes suggested by our team, uh, the main amend amendments that were made. Our section is probably the only section uh, whose text remained in the original version prepared by the Codification Council, even though there were some of the uh, comments by the Ministry of Economic Development and the working team. Um, all these comments were um, somehow uh, agreed upon, and we convinced our colleagues that the original version was better. The general provisions of international private law are uh, extra binding, uh, overriding mandatory provisions. A minor change is suggested. The problem is that in section uh, 6 this term is used several times. You see two of the articles that use it. And when a term is used twice or more, it usually means the same. This is where the problem lies. In different articles of section 6, 
this term, uh, overriding uh, mandatory law, is used in different senses. It's not unique to Russian law. If you take the Roman Convention of, of 1980, uh, which was before Rome 1 rule, in several languages, including English, uh, the same term, mandatory rules, in uh, Article 3 and Article 7, uh, it is used with different meanings. Our Western colleagues knew that completely different things were meant by that in those two articles. It's not quite as obvious here in Russia, so we thought it necessary to specify that 19, uh, that 1192 um, speaks about a very specific institute, whereas in other articles the mandatory uh, rule, rules are meant in the re regular sense um, which, which is accepted in, in civil law. Um, 1193, uh, we all know about the uh, problems that arise uh, in application of laws in Russian practice, and we made an attempt to introduce the division that is typical of international private law of foreign countries. Clear understanding that the public policy can be internal, internal public policy, and there is public policy uh, for the specific terms of, um, of international private law. And in 1193, uh, we, of course, mean public policy uh, as it is seen by the international private law. We hope that it will help correct the problems that arose when, uh, when this term was used in Russian court practice. Our next issue is probably one of the most important, and it is connected with the uh, uh, terms of legal person and uh, private law. According to current legislation, uh, it is uh, supposed to be the place of national registration of the legal person. And what kind of law is going to, what jurisdiction will be used uh, when, the, when the corporate veil is uh, lifted? Um, the original project, uh, the, the article on legal persons, had a special rule provision that offshore companies mostly working in Russia have to be included into a special list and as a sanction uh, it was suggested that non-compliance with this procedure um, leads to a solidary uh, responsibility of a, an offshore company like this not just the formal directors of this company, but all people who are actually managing the activity of these companies. So this new rule th that is suggested in point four, uh, it was its idea was to ensure the uh, application of Russian law and uh, the ch choice of creditors can be chosen not just by uh, legal persons but by the Russian law itself. Uh, the, the, the law is actually phrased in a broader sense, so it's not just offshore companies, any foreign company with primary activity in Russia. So our next question, which is probably of interest to uh, practicing lawyers in this room, how, what do you do with the so-called shareholder agreements? I mentioned that in our court practice, uh, I don't see how we could overcome the approach to the megaphone case, which was that it's impossible to choose uh, in a shareholder agreement uh, foreign law as the binding law. And I think that in other countries where such approach is used. We can just quote maybe Ukraine, where um, uh, by precedent and then by by law the same kind of decision was codified. Our working team discussed this at length, and we think that this conservative position is too strict. At the same time, 
At the same time, the Minister for Economic Development offered an opposing standpoint, a liberal approach, according to which there should be no restrictions in any shareholders' agreement and a foreign law can be chosen in this respect. This means that those super peremptory rules won't be working. Why didn't we use that approach and why we managed we succeeded in convincing the Minister for Economic Development that they shouldn't follow the liberal approach. Because if we analyze the standards of the Russian legislation, specifically Article 32.1 of the Law on Joint Stock Companies, there is quite a number of standards there which describe this relationship between shareholders. Non-compliance of the shareholders agreement uh, can result in lack of recognition of the decisions of the shareholders meeting. Uh, there may be uh, the commitments of the shareholders are fixed and they might be put down in writing in one or several documents. And we asked our colleagues from the ministry whether this standard should have a priority when we speak about the shareholder agreement of a Russian joint stock company. Yes, they agreed. In despite the fact that the uh, parties to the agreement can choose uh, foreign law as their governing law. My conviction, which the work group shares with me, is that these standards should not be treated as super mandatory or super peremptory rules because they are aimed at the protection of the interests of minority shareholders. And in my opinion, had we followed the liberal approach, we would have only aggravated the situation, because since we call these standards super mandatory, uh, this will give the courts an opportunity to characterize every Russian standard as super mandatory in spite that a different legislation system was chosen as governing for the shareholders agreement. This approach found its way into our draft amendments. There are also amendments related to the substantial law we have here a very interesting standard in uh, paragraph 1 of Article 2010 that uh, saying that the chosen law can be applied to the termination of the property rights and of other rights for real estate. However, uh, there is a clause saying that this should be done at no damage to the rights of other persons involved. Uh, what is so bad? Uh, this kind of clause is also used in Swiss legislation. It can happen so that one legislation is used to regulate the relationship between the parties to the agreement, but as soon as a third party emerges which has certain grounds to demand uh, property rights from a party to the agreement, uh, this relationship may be governed by a completely different law system. That's why we decided to exclude that article from the new code. Exclusive rights. Uh, exclusive rights to intellectual property. Uh, there is a gap in legislation 
uh, as compared to the internationally accepted practice. Initially, the whole section on intellectual property was supposed to be adopted uh, in that section, but there was a lot of criticism leveled against uh, this intention, and they decided to uh, elaborate on that uh, in more detail later. So the section on international private law uh, did not include any articles on intellectual uh, property, but uh, this error will be corrected. Also, uh, articles uh, 1209 and Paragraph second of Article 12100 about the uh, mandatory character of a written document uh, was excluded. We try uh, to implement uh, the governing principle of the Western uh, legislation. Uh, we try to keep the transaction uh, effective. Uh, without any obstacles uh, uh, and uh, offering different uh, forms and shapes in which this transaction may be concluded. Uh, speaking about the contract obligations, uh, one uh, very important amendment, uh, and this is uh, European experience uh, from the document uh, Rome 1. In Article 1211, um, we say uh, that characteristic application may be applied, so we have to take into account the characteristics of the country uh, which may have uh, an important influence about on uh, the compliance uh, to the contract. If a different procedure, different order uh, might be used, then a different law can be applied to. However, uh, these two principles uh, uh, may contradict one another. We decided to follow the rules row one. Uh, we decided to abandon the first great, the, the abandonment of the first criterion uh, may happen only uh, if uh, there is a closer relationship of some other law system to the contract. I'll leave out certain amendments which uh, wouldn't be interesting to the audience, but of course I uh, can explain that in the course of our discussion. Uh, two last things I wanted to say. There is a, a radically new standard or even a set of standards which regulates the voluntary representation. Uh, what representation uh, is necessary to conclude a transaction and how do we measure the extent of authority of the representative? Now uh, the legislation is archaic and um, incomplete. Uh, article uh, 1217 only describes the term of expiry of the power of attorney uh, according to the laws of the country where the power of attorney were, was issued. However, with the representation, um, the comments uh, recommend to follow Part 1 of Article 1217, uh, but that article uh, describes the commitments arising from uh, one-party agreements. Uh, but the 
experts say that uh, as a result of such transaction, no commitments arise uh, because uh, a different private law relations emerge. And there was a question why we should split Article 1217, uh, opening the way to uh, a better uh, definition of representation. And we have taken into account the foreign practice, uh, for instance, the Swiss law on international private law. And uh, uh, then uh, the last change is with the tort status. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'd like to draw attention to two things. After a tort, uh, the parties should uh, turn to the court of law according to the Russian legislation. And um, this restriction uh, is uh, hardly uh, compatible with the worldwide practice because the parties can choose any jurisdiction, any law system to turn to uh, in case of a tort. And the provision uh, that uh, follows the standards of Rome 2 rules is applied that if uh, there is an agreement between the parties, then the tort status can be determined according to the system of law chosen by the both parties. Uh, that's what I wanted to explain, and I will be ready to answer your questions, if any. Dear Anton Vladimirovich, I think that uh, our joint opinion will be that uh, your presentation was most informative and interesting. A couple of comments now. It is not by accident that Mr. Soskov uh, several times mentioned the form of a foreign economic transaction. Uh, let's now try to remember where from did we take those super mandatory standards applied to foreign economic transactions. Uh, they were born in the years uh, when uh, we had um, the Ministry for Foreign Trade in the Soviet Union, and it was considered that every commercial transaction is not only commercial, but a political transaction. And this problem became evident when the 1980 Convention on International Sales was de being developed. Uh, it is full of liberal norms, even in the part describing the evidence. And this is why this convention is so good, because it is a compromise which borrowed quite a lot of features from other law systems and jurisdictions. The, it had only one peremptory rule in that concerning the transactions concluded in writing. Uh, the Soviet delegation was behind that rule and it consists in the following. Uh, uh, the government that demands conclusion of a contract in writing may insert a clause in the provisions saying that 
transactions concluded not in a written form may not be implemented. And that was why this convention worked very good even in countries with different political systems. And now lots of water has passed under the bridges since then. Now we do not have any monop monopoly on foreign trade. And uh, I have not once been invited as an expert to the UK courts and I had to explain to the judge that the monopoly on foreign trade was lifted in this country and since it had been lifted there was no need in written transaction contract. This is why both Article 162 of the Civil Code, which uh, described uh, the mandatory character of the written contract, it was excluded from the Civil Code, and also, as Mr. Asuskov has said, the rule on the written transaction contract has been excluded from other documents. Now, what are the requirements to foreign economic transactions? Can it be concluded in oral form? Well, I'll now break uh, the rule established by Tali Ryan, who said that never submit to your initial impulses because they are always honest. I think that oral form will not be sufficient in case of a foreign economic transaction. Uh, the tenor of our civil code means, should mean only a simple written form. And the effectiveness of the transaction could be judged according to what has been written, and this is where it will be different from what the Convention prescribes. Also, Mr. Soskov touched upon the problem of the public procedure. I can say that I don't remember any instance when a party unhappy with the decision of a commercial arbitration court should advance public procedure alongside with other evidence. But in cases when our code includes these grounds as the grounds for the repeal of a sentence or court decision are very few. But I wanted to give you only one example, a recent example of that. Uh, it was published in the Bulletin of the Arbitration Court in January. A contract included between a Russian and a Swedish company contained a clause uh, in favor of the Swedish company. The transaction was uh, fairly big and uh, according to the Russian law the decision by the board of directors was necessary. Our company received uh, this consent of the board of directors. However, there were no consent of the board of directors of the Swedish party. Uh, the proceedings started at the arbitration court in Stockholm and the decision of the court was in favor of the Swedish company 
the Russian uh, uh, party contested and uh, later the decision was repealed because the Russian party submitted the consent of the board of directors while the Swedish company did not uh, present the consent of their board of directors and that was a violation of the equality of the parties to the transaction. And the first instance granted the decision in favor of the Swedish company while the second and third instances agreed with the Russian company. However, the High Arbitration Court later on ruled that Russian legislative standards can not uh, be extended to foreign legal entities. And the decision of the Swedish Arbitration Court was recognized and implemented in Russia. I am concluding my remarks uh, mentioning higher arbitration court. Here we have judge uh, this uh, court, uh, Mrs. Pavlova. When a new law appears, it is very important to see how it will be implemented in practice. In the very beginning, uh, there is a commercial uh, practice, but usually it is very diverse and there are lawsuits. We are a big country and there are lots of courts and the practice of court uh, decisions is not very homogeneous. And so the last uh, point in streamlining the decisions is uh, made by the High Arbitration Court. And this uh, was like in the past, in um, the British consignments of the 17th, 18th century, the, the captain of this ship uh, after God is this and that. So if we um, refer to the same uh, analogy, you know, uh, higher than the higher, super, uh, uh, higher arbitration court is only God himself. And I hope that Natalia Pavlova uh, will uh, tell us about all these aspects from her point of view. Thank you very much, dear Valery Abramovich. Yeah, in the practice of arbitration courts uh, of Russia, uh, these uh, cases are quite often uh, where there's a foreign element and also various uh, disputes related to the international private law. In the recent years, what we see in our uh, system is about 1,500 or 1,700 cases like this, and they refer to various aspects of the international private law. These are contractual uh, relations, corporate relations, partly relations to the property that is created through the prism and uh, through the uh, double taxation uh, perspective as well. So this is um, protection of a property in this case. And always this is not uh, simple uh, practice. So courts, uh, court judges always um, remember that uh, this is a logical exercise um, for professors. It's not only for professors. Uh, these original and complicated cases, uh, this is a complicated exercise for uh, logics of um, judges as well. The civil code we are discussing now in the version uh, which um, is um, uh, adopted today uh, actually already includes uh, various international standards because this section it was written not so long time ago and the practice and approaches modern approaches uh, had been analyzed I uh, should uh, note that uh, I wouldn't say that there's a lack of uh, legal uh, definitions, um, especially in terms of foreign participation, uh, because we always analyze not only uh, the Russian norms, but also international um, practices, and we see what similar institutions uh, 
uh, apply uh, these norms and how similar rights are protected there. And if we go back to the uh, public uh, order, we uh, very often meet with judges from other countries and uh, uh, international um, commercial arbitration very often uh, uses uh, this argument, but there are not so many decisions like that. This is uh, typical to other countries as well. A state uh, courts, they fill up this uh, category. So th this uh, is uh, done through uh, through the um, court uh, decisions. And uh, uh, speaking about this uh, public uh, policy qualification, uh, without it, 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 it uh, so we uh, do have it, and uh, there are bridges uh, to the uh, practice of uh, court uh, practices, and uh, this has been defined. But at the same time, um, because of um, the influence of our decisions, I understand it very well, approaches were formed, and those um, approaches that were initially um, formed in our uh, court and judicial practices, uh, that uh, found its way in uh, revisions and amendments uh, to the civil code. I'm happy to see that certain achievements of our uh, judicial uh, practice, uh, it, it uh, was reflected even in the first uh, sections of the Civil Code. There are two novelties, and actually the whole area was suffering from the lack of that. I'm speaking about Article 10, uh, because we cannot see any examples of its application. Although the civil code was um, adopted some time ago, uh, but that uh, we, we need it, especially when we speak about um, uh, foreign um, uh, physical persons. Uh, but in this uh, case, this article, yeah, it is modified, and now we will have. Um, a direct um, a provision, yeah, so the uh, principle of a fairness, uh, fair behavior, uh, yeah, it is uh, substantiated by the code and all participants and uh, all these relations with uh, the foreign element. And uh, what is important, uh, this uh, will be also used for protection of rights. And this um, principle uh, is uh, clearly specified in the civil code. Another uh, good positive thing is that uh, it is uh, forbidden now to get a benefit uh, from um, unfair and uh, dishonest uh, behavior. If we look at uh, specific examples of uh, judicial practice, uh, they haven't changed much um, during the last seven, ten years. And uh, this uh, spectrum is as follows. Before uh, this um, qualification about the applicable uh, law, when um, relations have nothing to do to the norms uh, with the specific uh, countries, when the relations uh, have uh, absolutely internal character, for example, when uh, shares or securities or shares are uh, sold by a Russian shareholding um, country, but uh, the, uh, the law of an another uh, country is applied. Or when there is a foreign element, for example, there are off two offshore countries, uh, two, sh two offshore companies, and beneficiaries of them are Russian physical or legal entities who that are formally uh, registered in um, uh, offshore jurisdiction countries. When they uh, realize when this is not. Um, uh, profitable of them to apply uh, to uh, courts over there because maybe it is expensive or maybe they are not aware of this uh, possibility. Then they uh, try to use Russian law to apply the Russian law and um, Russian uh, lawsuits for a transaction that was concluded in London, for example. So in uh, specific elements, this uh, can be a signal for this um, uh, dishonest um, behavior and uh, uh, very often, 
um, this uh, cannot be identified um, especially oh, an example uh, can be uh, when, uh, a, uh, for example, an airplane is bought that is registered by a foreign country. For uh, judicial practice is very important that um, provisions have been uh, corrected that um, are related to uh, con uh, contractual agreements. Uh, now it is mentioned explicitly that uh, if uh, there is um, a deal on um, provision of uh, services here, remunerated uh, services, here we so here, yeah, we can use the uh, law of the country, of the party which provides these services. And recently, we have seen that very often our party is not protected, the consumer uh, party, especially if we cannot um, define it as a consumer because uh, d uh, due to, uh, well, in, in line with the uh, law, the consumer is... Um, a physical um, person uh, using uh, the services for uh, personal use. But uh, very often uh, these relations, uh, if legal entities uh, enter into such relations. For example, if we speak about uh, tourist uh, services or p package tours, a package uh, tours, uh, there's a law on uh, tourist services. This is how it is defined uh, in Russian law. A legal entity may uh, purchase uh, these uh, services for uh, its uh, employees, for example. But now we see that a legal, so it, this revision has been made that a legal entity can um, be defined as a consumer uh, because uh, these services are purchased uh, not for commercial reasons but for private use. But still, uh, there is a problem with um, the rejection. Um, of such services, you know that there is a mandatory norm that the party that uh, c consumes uh, this uh, service uh, has the right to uh, reject uh, it, and then uh, it is um, reimbursed the, the services that have been conducted uh, so far for the purposes of this of provision of this service. But uh, what if our uh, Russian um, uh, customer? Uh, cancels um, this, uh, hotel reservation or uh, cancels uh, air tickets, then uh, in the past uh, there was an issue of applicable uh, law and uh, uh, function of our mandatory norms. Now customers are protected, but only physical persons as customers. Uh, the question was whether we can expand these norms um, over to legal entities. Uh, the Higher Arbitration Court hasn't taken a decision uh, yet, but we believe that our mandatory norms will be used that protect our customers, uh, we, and they, which say that various penalties, various fines that that are used uh, when um, the service is uh, cancelled. For example, a hotel uh, booking cancellation. And this is possible uh, abroad, but which are not possible here in Russia. They will be operated, uh, they are regulated by this, these mandatory norms. So. Uh, only the actual uh, costs uh, need uh, to be reimbursed. And uh, another thing, uh, a recent um, thing that um, we uh, faced, and uh, it uh, is still not uh, covered um, in uh, the new version of the Civil Code. This concerns uh, services which are in the 21st century. They uh, become uh, cross-border, uh, transnational, and uh, this is uh, should be regulated by the international private law. These are relations that are uh, internet-based, internet communication, for example, banking services. 
In the civil code, there is a conflict um, uh, clause that if uh, there is a bank deposit or an account, uh, the uh, law uh, of, of the country of the bank will be used. But due to the nature of these relations and due to the fact, and maybe the bank is in Switzerland, but the consumer is in Russia, or a company that has an account in the Swiss bank uh, is uh, located in Russia, then uh, the uh, and maybe the bank only has a branch in um, Russia. Which law uh, shall be applied, Swiss law or the Russian Federation law, because the service was provided by a branch of this bank uh, located in Russia? The uh, situation becomes even more complicated, and I refer to a recent case that was uh, discussed by uh, the court, uh, one of the largest banks, it was a state Latvian bank, without legalizing uh, its uh, business in um, the Russian Federation and without opening any branches here in line with the Russian laws and uh, without uh, getting um, a permit from the central bank. So it has been providing uh, banking services. They had a building. They had an office uh, in the center of Moscow and in St. Petersburg. And uh, information was uh, information about its services was available uh, on its uh, websites, and it was uh, on Russian and uh, international domains. So there was um, a perception that the p uh, clients they um, felt that yes they uh, were properly serviced by this bank because they could visit uh, their office and they could sign agreements without um, going without applying to the head office which is in Riga and uh, without uh, going uh, there uh, to Latvia however as an organizational form, as a legal entity, this bank was not uh, registered uh, and it was not legalized by the Russian Federation. And here we had uh, to follow uh, the practice of the European of the Council of, of Europe, and there has been already uh, 10 uh, cases, and uh, they uh, specify uh, the situation when branches and um, rep offices are opened, and there are specific criteria, and one of these uh, criteria is the uh, perception um, of uh, customers. Uh, their perception of whether they are uh, they are getting services from the head uh, office uh, or a rep office and whether it is uh, possible to order such services without uh, applying uh, to the um, headquarters and the presidium uh, took a decision that it is possible to use uh, this approach in our country as well. And um, in this situation, we'll uh, have uh, to think that, yes, the services were provided by a foreign bank here in Russia, although it was not formally uh, legalized in the Russian jurisdiction. Why am I saying that um, this is uh, especially important in terms of this uh, transition yeah, because these are specific services and they are um, cross-border and uh, transnational and in relation to this we need to consider uh, how close uh, a transaction is to specific location. But in this case, it was the place where services were provided and the uh, subjective perception of customers, so that will be uh, prevailing. In terms of the uh, form uh, of um, transactions, here we can uh, say that this uh, approach yeah, should be welcome because life is changing. and. Um, now we are analyzing this problem 
and not from uh, the perspective of the uh, traditional written form, but from the point of view whether it is uh, possible to uh, see uh, an, an agreement uh, as uh, concluded if there was only written email communication, whether this is acceptable. Uh, right now, there is no one definitive um, answer, a decision. We uh, haven't had a precedent and we didn't discuss this, but the parties have uh, been um, substantiating this position and I believe we are going to face it in the near future and I believe it would be very progressive uh, to accept uh, this norm in the form that has been proposed by the developers of this so that uh, to put our uh, practice in line with international standards. Then, uh, speaking about the letter of power of attorney, this is important for courts. Uh, this um, uh, powers of attorney that are provided to our courts. Very often, international participants, they provide uh, powers of attorney that was issued uh, in another uh, country, but then it was apostilled in another jurisdiction, and the translation was made in uh, again in another uh, jurisdiction. And the courts are very often, they are finding themselves in a dead end, whether this is in line with the Russian norm. And we uh, have been using a general uh, norm, uh, which is part of the international uh, private law. If the Russian uh, law uh, norms uh, have been uh, satisfied, then we'll be uh, viewing it uh, in line with the Russian norms. And um. If a foreign legal person presents an um, uh, affidavit issued in Russia, uh, even though the legal person is registered in a different jurisdiction, the question arises whether it's possible. Sometimes such documents are accepted because otherwise uh, it would limit uh, general civil and economic turnover. So we accept it if it corresponds to our legal norms. The question of statute, of statute law, uh, it's also a problem of status of legal persons. The court sees that the laws regarding offshore companies, the problem of their status should be somehow solved in legislation. Uh, not really regarding uncovering the beneficiaries, which is, of course, very important um, for the court work to be efficient. But in 2010, we kind of felt our way through the case of um, Dimax Limited against citizen Chigirinsky. We know that he is a major businessman, but he was just, you know, a a physical person, a beneficiary of offshore company in that case. And there were three precedents in this case regarding the possibility of solving the um, argument with the company through um, suing a citizen, a private person, uh, against the uh, credits of a company. The same person guaranteed uh, the conclusion of the uh, obligations according to these transactions. So, if a citizen is involved in entrepreneurial relations, the arbitration courts consider these relations to be economic relations. So, this person is considered to be an entrepreneur, a businessman, because this person's activity uh, is aimed at deriving profit. As regards offshore companies, we are troubled not exactly by the uncovering of beneficiaries, even though it's very important, but the very definition of their status. And as a conclusion, the uh, definition of national jurisdiction of such subjects, because we see here a clear connection with other legal uh, norms. The courts are forced 
you see Ivanov, Petrov and Sidorov with a company registered in Britain. Uh, you immediately see a problem arising. Uh, of course, there is also a problem of informing, of serving orders and so on. But the problem of establishing its status, of finding beneficiaries, uh, an example uh, that struck me was the Damodedeva Airport. We could think of public policy in here and all other safety issues that arise, to say nothing of the uh, prosecutors who were looking for the owners of the airport for three days after the terrorist act at the airport. Uh, and we were also trying to disentangle that. There was one Mary Smith. Uh, who is the tenth subject of this chain, uh, who is managing the Moscow airport of Damodedeva, while all other actual owners of the, uh, of the uh, capital have no uh, relation to the strategic facility. So I think it would be very nice to have our laws uh, on the status of legal persons to have the same divided um, conflict of law uh, clause like a step towards the continental law uh, without the uh, principal activity. I don't know, maybe uh, we would be told by our colleagues uh, to what extent this idea was discussed during the drafting of the Civil Code, how relevant it is for our legislation. I think that the courts would, would have a much easier life if they could base their activity on, on that kind of law. And it would also ensure a better protection of the laws of, all of the rights of all participants. If such criteria of the location where activity is performed could be used as a criterion for a subsidiary a tie um, which could help us vary the relations and define which uh, law should be applied. I think I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, you're, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Natalia, for your excellent speech. By the way, you provoked a question on my side. I don't know whether it will be a pleasure for you. Uh, the question is uh, regarding the um, the uh, affidavit, the letter of authority. A letter of authority uh, can have different forms because the law on that in the civil code in its international section, uh, they regard the letter of authority regarding transaction, which is the authority of material uh, character, but there are also authority for representing someone in court. And I think that these two kinds of authority are essentially different. If you apply the general rule that any authority includes court authority, um, the place of its issuance, like England, for example, uh, is evident because the barrister in the English court uh, uh, speaks without any letter of authority and a verbal agreement is enough. Does it mean that if he comes to the Russian court, he would be, uh, he would be accepted? I'm completely sure he wouldn't. Why? Because the laws the, uh, of the international section of our civil code only apply to the authority, letter of authority of uh, material of essential character. We don't have any special uh, points regarding letters of authority issued abroad. So the letter of authority I issued to a foreign representative have to uh, comply with the law in Russia. I've been the um, uh, the president of the um, uh, treaty uh, court in Russia. I had a secretary, Mr. Skorodumov, the uh, former investigator of the uh, prosecutorial office, and he used to say, "Believe my investigative experience. This signature is false. It's fake." 
Why? Uh, do we do we regard civil law or criminal cases? It's civil. So let's overlook it. So uh, once we have a claim from overseas, I cannot tell you what it is, but you know there is a foreign foreign claimant, and the claim is towards a Russian um, defendant. So a former Russian citizen is represented here, so uh, he lives abroad, but he speaks Russian and so on. So there is a letter of authority. Uh, dear sir, I say, I cannot accept this letter. Why? Well, you signed the claim, and according to our law, this has to be specifically uh, laid out in the letter of authority, but in, in our country it's not necessary. Well, so we started arguing. Uh, he was very stubborn, and he filed a complaint to the president of the uh, Trade and Industry Chamber, and I received a copy of that claim. And he was uh, actually referring to the basis of uh, civil law of 91 with the same law, with the same point of law. Well, yeah, there is the point of um, place of issuance, but it's about transactions. And here we have pro procedure. This is a procedure letter of authority. So it doesn't have anything to do with that. Uh, and you have to take the procedure, but the procedure doesn't say anything about that. So the general rule says that you can't take that. So basically, they uh, they won the case, but here the uh, this case shows that uh, you can't use the points of our international international civil code to procedural um, rules. Here you have to use the procedural and arbitration code. Dear colleagues, I think I think that yes, please. Thank you. Uh, regarding letters of authority for uh, appearing in court or arbitration, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that in the new uh, project of 11.17.2, uh, there is a new r a rule uh, which is intended to exclude this problem, because if the letter of authority is issued for representing in state or uh, treaty court, um, it has to um, comply with the rules of the country where this court is based. Because this is an ambiguous question, if we take the um, CAS uh, practice, uh, we uh, look at the, um, at the conflict of law points uh, that are outlined there. Um, and the place of issuance of the letter of authority plays an important part here. As regards its form, we have a special provision in a different article. So as for the question about your uh, thinking of uh, disposing of the incorporation principle to the idea of the place where the legal person is based, uh, there was a reference to European experience, and I would like to point out that previously Western European continental countries actively used that principle, like German practice, where this position was very strict. But uh, at the same time, right now, there is a shift in European practice. There is a, uh, an opposite trend when the European Court of Justice uh, in a series of cases, uh, Senator Subrazering Sibir and Aspiring Art, uh, I think our foreign colleagues know these cases, uh, said that in relations between countries of the Euro European Union, this principle of the position uh, of the location of the legal person cannot be used to define the law relevant for the legal person. Uh, th and thus, even though such uh, court decisions are not binding to uh, foreign national legislators, especially uh, as applied to third parties. I, I, as far as I know, German colleagues are actively uh, discussing this idea 
thinking that it should be used not just to companies from other companies uh, from other countries but also to companies from all countries of the world if we will use this criterion where the main organization is based we will face the same problems faced by germany why these um, these uh, cases made it to ICJ. If we uh, do, we recognize the uh, legal right of that company. I don't think it's a correct approach if we deny the status of the law subject to a foreign company. It means that all transactions concluded with this company are invalid. So when we discussed that issue, we found that the consequence an offshore company which is mainly working in Russia all people formally or actually managing the activity of this company will be solidarily re responsible according to these uh, obligations that is a better approach than the approach based on the denying of foreign rights um, the foreign companies court rights and another um, about circumvention of law another note it's uh, um, I would like to stress that the position of uh, our working group was that this institution could not should not be applied in Russia this position was uh, very firm when we were drafting the initial version because the the uh, point about circumvention of laws was there and it was excluded from there our colleagues working on general provisions who are now uh, suggesting to include this provision um, uh, prohibiting the circumvention of law in section 10. They do not insist on applying this uh, this point in our section but I think if this point will be accepted it doesn't mean that in Russian uh, in Russian uh, international private law uh, will have the idea of circumvention of law. Uh, and uh, one last thing. Uh, Natalia said and uh, uh, mentioned an interesting example from uh, the company from British Virgin Islands which have a prerogatory agreement regarding the uh, complaints settled in Russia with the application of Russian law. I don't see anything bad about that. Uh, I just wanted to understand what's the problem here and whether you mean that the higher arbitration court considers that if there is a prorogation agreement in favor of Russian courts, the Russian courts can use some kind of, of the forum non convenience and say that the Russian courts will not uh, review this case because r the Russian jurisdiction is uh, inapplicable in this case. I just wanted to to understand what is the problem with this situation. Dear colleagues, you are now seeing that all your colleagues have completed their jobs. So now it's your turn. You can now ask questions and we hope that you will say a few words. Uh, abusing a little my moderator position, I, I specifically um, prevented the questions during the panel because by analogy um, the uh, Cassation's uh, Council rule was used here. Uh, do you want to answer to all your opponents at once or one by one? At once because uh, it's easier to generalize in that case to uh, to reply to some previous remarks and so on. So right now please ask your questions to any of the panelists or to all of them and then uh, you can speak regarding anything that you want to uh, that you heard or you want to hear. Floor. Just a, a very specific professional question from my, part, from my point of view. I am 
representative of the uh, Italian National Chambers of Civil Law Notaries and so uh, very in and frequently interested by application of private international law, especially in our country, obviously for matrimonial property regime, for instance, on successions, uh, companies as well. And my uh, uh, specific question today to the Russian legislator or someone who is helping the Russian legislator is, uh, is any other provision in the new civil code about the recognition and enforcement of authentic instruments? I mean uh, about the use or the international use of authentic documents as recognized, for instance, in Brussels, one, in Brussels conventions, first of all, and then in Brussels one regulation, in the European uh, enforcement order regulation, and, and, and in many other uh, uh, um, European regulations. So um, my, my interest, obviously, uh, uh, is about the fact that if there is uh, any specific provision in the, in the new uh, Russian uh, private international law, and uh, 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 if in this case uh, you have had any inspiration uh, due to the uh, European EU regulations. Particularly, I would like to underline the uh, new text which is... Uh, it will be published maybe next month of June of the European <laughs> Regulation on uh, International Successions in which uh, the use obviously in this, in this matter of authentic instruments is uh, in my opinion uh, uh, very well regulated not only for the enforcement uh, as uh, um, for the enforcement order but also for the probative value of the authentic instrument. Thank you very much. Uh, since you mentioned the Brussels Convention, uh, I wanted to say that when we speak about harmonizing legal institutions with the uh, agencies of the European Union, uh, we were, yes, oriented towards the Brussels Convention and regulations. At the process of the civil proceedings, they depend in this country on who participates in the proceedings and who are the parties. So we have court of arbitration and we have the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation and we have two procedural codes, one for arbitration and the other for civil procedure. Yes, of course, we borrowed the criteria uh, from the European Code and approaches as described by the Brussels Convention uh, on contract law, on general law, and of course the High Arbitration Court uh, will never restrict in any way the prorogation agreements. It will not violate the exclusive jurisdiction of the courts. Uh, speaking about case I cited as an example there were no prorogation uh, agreement. There was a dispute on the property right for a plane registered abroad by a Russian party. Uh, when legal entities or private entrepreneurs take part in the transactions, our regulations match uh, practically in full the regulations as described by the European Union. Law on international private law. Uh, so that is why the rules, conflict of law rules and also procedural rules, they are split between several legislative instruments. And the uh, civil code it includes only conflict of law rules, 
only conflict of law rules that uh, are connected with the civil relationships. And as far as I understood, your question is, uh, um, is concerned uh, more with uh, procedural issues. And that is why uh, it was impossible for our working group to decide all these issues in the Russian civil code because they shall be decided in Russian procedural legislation and the mandate of our working group was limited only to proposing amendments to the Russian civil code. And uh, yes, I agree with you, we have a problem with these um, um, documents, with the recognition of documents if uh, they are not the decisions of the state courts but some instruments of public notary and, uh, and so on. So we, I, I think we have a kind of lacuna here and uh, we should uh, propose some, um, some legislative provisions in this regard, but they shouldn't be in the text of the Russian Civil Code. Thank you. Еще был аспект вопроса, касающийся наследственных отношений. Но в этой части... Мы также говорим о правилах сукцессии. Теперь мы более активны в этом отношении. Министерство the rules of succession and I hope there will be certain steps on harmonization in that direction. Well, I uh, understood the question differently and this is why I did not understand your answers. Our colleague asked if we can apply European legal standards in uh, cases tried in Russia. We do not apply European standards and regulations and we are not going to apply them as long as we are not members of the European Union. Speaking about Rome 1 and Rome 2 standards, again, we do not apply them because we are not EU members. We can take them into account. We can understand and take them uh, and he, take heed of them, but we cannot apply them since they are not in our legislation. I have not a question, perhaps, uh, but an idea to uh, continue our discussion. There is a great conceptual issue. Uh, is it really wise to include international private law and its regulations into the civil code? Might be it would be better to have a separate law on into a separate law, not considering it a part of the civil code. International private law should not be part of the national civil code. Might be Valery Ivanovich, who is an expert in proceedings, and Mr. Soskov is uh, more concerned about the international side of this. What will be your opinion about that? Well, I'm ready to speak uh, my opinion. Out. I must say that even inside our working group, though, we didn't discuss that uh, issue seriously. 
our mandate was to make amendments to the civil code. And uh, in our working group, which included leading lawyers from Moscow and other cities, they had different standpoints. For instance, Mr. Makovsky, uh, he likes the present day situation and he is not in favor of a separate law on international private law. While Mr. Izvekov, who developed the text of Section 6, he favors that idea. My opinion would be that the countries which undertake reforms of the international private law, uh, they adopt a specific law to that end. And uh, that is, that does not only help to eliminate legal collisions and overlapping of standards, uh, because this overlapping has never hindered any legal proceedings. I think that within the framework of uh, a separate law, it would be easier to agree all the contradictory issues of procedural and private law. Again, for instance, when we speak about the power of attorney, uh, uh, it is treated as something having a dual legal nature. There are issues uh, which can be treated accordingly. For instance, the power of attorney can be treated as a uh, as a uh, matter of uh, substanti uh, substantive law and as a part of, uh, as an instrument of procedural law. Well, again, I would not completely agree with what was said here. You remember what Pushkin said, you can be a, a, a well a well-established business person, but still think about the beauty of your males. Uh, the idea should be to harmonize uh, the legal standards which are contained in the civil code and uh, uh, in some sections of that. There might be internal contradictions in it, but it will be easier to eliminate contradictions if they are within one body of law. We should distinguish between the legal nature of the international private law and uh, if we, uh, whether we have it in the civil code or in a separate law, uh, we won't necessarily uh, make these standards collide because substantive law, it regulates the material relationship between the parties while the collision uh, laws, uh, they determine how and when these standards should be applied. I wanted also to say a few words. Uh, what we need, we need to have a clear cut and well defined laws. In the 21st century, meaning that our country should occupy uh, prominent position in the international community, we must have legislation which would be more tuned to international standards so that our legal system 
that our legislation could be a part of the worldwide legislative process. So this should be a, a specific system of relations, a specific environment. In my opinion, it should be taken out of the civil code and it should be as a separate law be applicable, applicable also on a worldwide scale. But this is a matter not for the foreign but for the domestic policy. Anybody else who would like to speak? Out. I would just say that um, the judge's comment just now about the uh, 21st century and need for uh, more um, international, um, as I mentioned uh, last month, the um, representative from the Ministry of Justice, the Deputy Minister, came and um, announced the increased interest and involvement of the Russian Federation in the work of the Hague Conference. And I think that represents the same spirit of trying to work towards um, being part of these major conventions and the new work that's going on, for instance, in judgments. A representative from Russia came actually for the um, working group the week before. So um, I think there is a certainly increased interest um, from Russia and is from our side, from what we see, and I think judging from the re response of the countries who are members of the Hague Conference, they are very enthusiastic and happy to see that um, active engagement. Ну что ж, если больше вопросов или желающих выступить нет, то тогда... If there are no questions or no comments, I would like to thank everyone for taking part in this workshop. And we'll be seeing you again.